What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to the Japonin episodes, episode 15 and a half. Uh, we filmed 15 last week, and our internet decided it didn't like it. So we're going to refilm. Um, friendly reminder, if you enjoy this podcast, please like, subscribe, turn on notifications. And there's always one other I forget. Bring the Join bell. Team Bring Japonin. the bell. And yes, um, if you like our content, please go to teamtroponent.com. Anything we talk about here, a lot of times we go into more in-depth discussion um, on the actual website. We also have a team discord for those members where they can converse with us just a little bit more. So um, we're going to kick off today's podcast with a topic that we talked a little bit about um, on one of today's um, social media posts, the idea of the rack chin as a lat builder. And basically in the context of so many people right now, it's, it's very in vogue to only train lats in one plane of motion. Um, that's a sagittal plane which is basically this, mm -hmm. um, well, for a lat, this, um, and the rack chin functions very well um, as a lat builder still in a different plane of motion. So mm -hmm. you can kick that off. Um, yeah, so and if you haven't seen what a rack chin is, I guess it's, it's not the most in vogue exercise at the moment, but if you haven't seen it, go Google it. Um, popularized by uh, Dante Trudell and DC Training, which is probably one of the better low volume frequency, high frequency systems ever ever put together. Um, you know, basically you're, it's like a pull up, but your hands are, you could use a Smith machine bar or like a, a bar set in a rack at the correct height. And then you've got your feet out in front of you supported on something. And what it basically allows you to do is a pull up where your torso isn't being pulled into a straight up and down position. Um, and I guess just to maybe a little bit of context, a lot of us don't really like pull ups specifically as a lat builder. It can work for some people great, but the reason it can kind of be difficult is that it's tough to get yourself into a position where you're really keeping tension on the lat throughout the entire range of motion unless you are just obscenely strong at pull-ups and can manipulate your torso position as you're pulling and even then you're having to concentrate a whole lot on keeping your body in the right position so basically a rack chin puts you into kind of a pull-up ish position but it's a really ideal angle for actually training the lat because your torso and your humerus are more like that say 130, 140 degree angle, kind of like the maximum angle you'd want for actually training the lat. And it's great for hitting like the lower lat, especially. Um, <clears throat> but like Danny said, a lot, of, a lot of people have gravitated to using only lat movements in the sagittal plane, which is where you're either pulling kind of like your arm straight out in front of you, or maybe a little bit to the side where you're kind of orienting your torso a little bit towards the line of pull to like line up with the lat a little bit better. And- Think like a pull down variation. Right, yeah. And I guess a really simple, like something in the in the frontal plane that we all, all often do, or maybe used to do, is like just a basic lat pull down with a wide grip. And then something in the sagittal plane would be, uh, probably the most popular thing right now would just be a one arm pull down where you're keeping your elbow really tight to the torso. Or like a seated cable rope. Yeah. Um, so I decided to give Rackton's another try because they've always given me pretty good results when I have done them. and. For me, they're a fantastic exercise, and I guess we can talk a little bit about why they work. You know, even though they're in the they're in the uh, the frontal plane, which people have kind of gotten away from, and uh, Danny can probably elucidate this a little bit better than I can. But I think the crux of the issue is that the you know our muscles are not they're not singular they don't work in a singular plane, and the lats especially basically wrap around the rib cage, and you know, when your lat contracts, it is basically contracting kind of around the rib cage, to, to put it simply. And so what really matters is, is the arm path actually forcing the lat to do most of the work? And if you do a rack chin properly, that is, you're not loading up a crazy amount of weight, you're not allowing yourself to get into a torso position where you have to just use your traps, kind of like an inverted row. If you get yourself into the right position, you're using an appropriate load and you don't let your scapula stay up here, it can be a really great lat movement. Um, it also lets you get a, a super deep stretch in the bottom, which I think a lot of us have found is especially helpful for lat hypertrophy. Um, that's kind of become another controversial topic mm -hmm. as an aside here too. Like, I mean, I think a lot of us have found that, that um, there's a lot of stretch needed growth to be had for, for certain muscles in particular, like lats, triceps, pecs, quads. quads. Yes. And um, so yeah, yeah, the quad, kind of quads especially, but a lot of people have kind of started saying, oh, it's not really a thing, and you know, pass attention doesn't really matter, but man, like, I, I don't think I've found any better lat movements than the ones that let me get a huge stretch in the bottom, and I feel a way bigger stretch specifically on lats doing a rack chin at the bottom than I do on a pull-up at the bottom or a lat pull-down. Um, so those are some of the reasons that I really like it for lat training, but you could probably 
elaborate? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are a lot of things that I think need to be touched on here. Number one, the, one of the other benefits of the rack chin relative to something like a, a pull-up is that you're not having to use your whole body weight, which if you're a 300-pound dude, trying to do pull-ups with 300 pounds is pretty challenging. But I think the other thing to keep in mind is that the actual range of motion, people look at their overhead range of motion. Most of us are limited overhead. Um, and one of the benefits of the rack chin is that it allows you to position your torso in, um, in a way that actually uses the range of motion that you have and that you can own. Anytime you're trying to force into your range of motion that you don't actually have, you're probably going to end up cranking on the joint um, or you know, cranking into the joint capsule in a way that um, isn't really super friendly to um, growth because at that point it's not mechanical tension on the muscle, you're putting the tension somewhere else in the body. Um, and I think you know, with the rack chain, Dave hit on another point that's really, really important, and that is the rib cage. And where this all kind of came from is that it's been very in vogue the last maybe year or so to where people will say anything wide grip is going to be upper back rather than lat. And that's where Dave started kind of incorporating these back into his training as, as a lat movement. Um, and, you know, one of the things that he hit on that I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate is how the lat sits on the rib cage. And so when you can actually allow the rib cage to retract backwards and we talked a little bit about how with the like way bent forward troponin row um, or the dc row um, that actually allows the lat to fully lengthen um, if you actually go and you like pull up a picture like you google like lats on rib cage you're gonna see that to actually get the muscle to stretch you have to find a little bit of flexion or a little bit of movement through the rib cage to really force those fibers to elongate. If you're cranking down on that rib cage constantly, you're not really gonna get that. And with the rack chin, gravity is actually working with you, given your legs are elevated to almost put a little bit of traction like through the rib cage, through the lower back, and actually pull everything into kind of a retractive position. Um, I could go on a really nerdy tangent about how so many of us as bodybuilders and powerlifters uh, tend to have the opposite um, kind of pattern where our rib cage is stuck forward. Um, so I think that's one reason it's really effective too. Just even thinking about um, if you kind of do life with your rib cage in this forward position, which is going to shorten the lat a little bit, being able to even access the other side of that range of motion or the other side of that kind of pendulum is a really, really powerful neurological input that should carry over into your other lat training too. And I think that's where the stretch comes in, where being able to find that position, like if you can feel that, you can find that and then translate it or lateralize it to something else you're doing in training, it's an incredibly powerful stimulus, not only in the reaction, but it should allow your other training to really um, yeah. take off too. Yeah, and on that note, I think if you try a couple of these movements that we've mentioned, so there's the reaction, and then there's also the, some people call them a troponin rows now because Justin's made it popular, or Dante rows, or way, way bent forward rope rows. Basically, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's just a, how would you describe it? It's kind of like a pull, like a crossover between a row, a pull down, and a pull over. Um, it's basically a, a very bent forward pull yeah. over. And it's a great lat movement, but that and the reaction, I think both make it easy to feel that, that stretch on your lats, like not, not just under your armpit where you would think, but like all the way down to your sacrum. Mm -hmm. You get that stretch position right. And then you, you can really tell how your lat, you know, your lat all converges right at the top of your humerus, but they, it attaches, you know, like from your mid back all the way down to your sacrum. And to really hit those, those lower lat fibers that we all want to give us that, that big sweeping lat from the back. Like Danny said, you've, like feeling that stretch, I think, really makes not only that exercise effective, but a lot of the other lat exercises that you might do. Um, but what she said about being a large dude and doing this movement is also definitely true. And I've, I've felt this, I mean, now I'm like getting fairly close to 300 pounds, but even when I was like 240, 250, doing pull-ups really intensely and approaching failure started to feel a little bit janky on the bicep tendons. And I think that's one reason you probably don't see a lot of really big bodybuilders doing them. It's not out of laziness per se, is that one, it's kind of dangerous, and two, it's just hard to feel the lats working. And, and the reaction kind of addresses both issues. And I mean, I could <clears throat> I could get strong enough on reactions that the total load was equivalent to doing a pull-up. Like let's, mm -hmm. you know, my part of my legs are partly supported, but let's say I'm 290 and I've got 100 pounds sitting in my waist, you know, that's more than doing a bodyweight pull-up. But the position is such that I can really use my lats and not crank on the on the bicep tendon so hard. Well, let's, let's peel back for a sec. Um, if that's okay, because I want to talk about, again, like, we've talked a lot about the lat mechanics, but I think for people listening to this, like, again, there's been such a divergence in upper back versus lat training. And I think we categorize movements so quickly into upper back versus lat. And at the end of the day, like, yes, your position and your setup are going to bias one of those more than the other, 
but very rarely are they like completely exclusionary. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are going to look at the rack chin and say it's like wide grip. And like, yeah, I, it can be, it doesn't have to be. Um, but I think that, I think what people forget is the fact that like muscles are three dimensional. They're not just a straight, you know, linear. And Justin, you can probably really appreciate one of the things I love about watching you train actually, and like your old training videos, um, is that for you, it never looked like things were just straight point A to point B. Like you really appreciated the structure of the muscle being a three dimensional, um, tri -planar structure. Yeah, I think that comes from like, uh, actually, I was going to say that comes from, if you're, like, if you're training like, as a bodybuilder, you're thinking differently than if you're training as a powerlifter. If you're training as a bodybuilder, you're kind of thinking, you're not worried about the movement, you're worried about the muscle. You know, like, so you, it, I'm supposed to feel this movement in this muscle. And, like, to, to kind of, uh, as a, uh, I'm a COVID, <laughs> my brain just doesn't work. I do, I do lateral. Justin's are running a high fever this week. <laughs> Yeah, I have COVID and my brain is just not functioning. But I do lateral raises in a weird way. And every time someone sees me do them, they, you know, they tell me I'm doing it wrong, basically. And I, you know, I think, well, I don't, like, what do you mean doing it wrong? My shoulders are my best body part. So, you know, the way I'm doing them really burns my, my side delts. And that's my goal with the movement. And so that, 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 that's like what you said with reactions. I never real, the overhand reactions never worked for me until I found a, a bar that had uh, the multi grips and like a neutral medium grip. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's my reaction. The, I don't know what it is, like with pull-ups, it's not even, even a strength thing. Uh, like at my largest, you could put me on a pull-up bar, put my chin over the bar, and I don't think I could hold my weight there. Just like everything was just too cramped together. You know, people don't realize when you get that big and that bulky, yeah. you know, like a movement like that where all these muscles are crammed together, you're not just lifting your weight, you're lifting against the compression of all those muscles, especially on a back movement. That compression helps you on, helps you on movements where you go from a compressed state to an elongated state, like a squat or bench press. All that compression helps you kind of gives you leverage out of the bottom. But on back movements, it's the opposite. <clears throat> and as you get larger, it gets, I think... Some of the core movements that work when you're when you're smaller really start fighting against you because, uh, mm -hmm. well, a there's no way to there's no way to decrease the load because if you do bands, bands are going to de uh, decrease the load at the at the stretch position where you're strongest, you know, and they they stop working at the contracted position when all your muscles are condensed together and you're fighting against that compression plus the weight of the movement, and that, that's what I liked about rack chins was it seemed like I could get at least with the neutral grip I could get at that top position where all the, all the, my shoulders and upper back muscles and triceps and lats, they weren't all just compressed together quite as hard. I wasn't fighting that, that compression. It's almost like a, you know, like a yeah. stress ball, you know, it's like you're squeezing the stress ball, eventually it gets so com compact, you can't squeeze it anymore. And on a chin from, if you're really large, that, that point happens before you complete the, the range of motion of a chin, you're just too compressed. Well, that's almost how, like, when you, when we were at Elite in January, and we looked at the chest supported rows for you, and the first thing that happened when you grabbed the dumbbell was you compressed. Mm -hmm. Like, that was your, yeah. that was yeah. like, that's where you've trained for so long. That's your body's home base or homeostasis. I think that's, you know, there are a couple of really, really good points within what you were just talking about. And the first is that, um, you know, no matter what someone on social media says, it's a very, very popular to come out as a very opinionated, and there's one right way to do a movement. If you're going to do a side belt movement, you have to be leaned forward in the Y raise and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Great, but it has to work for you. Mm -hmm. um, super important. And I think the other thing you mentioned that I really like is the addition of the neutral grip to the rack chin. Um, I use that all the time, almost as like a pseudo diagnostic for my uh, PT clients, especially my bigger guys who are built like you two and kind of live like here. Because you'll see when people grab the bar, you can just kind of inherently tell if they're like really, really thumb heavy on something like a pronated grip, they're going to live in this kind of internally mm -hmm. rotated compressed state. Versus if someone can actually get pinkies and ring fingers involved and like really centrate that joint, find a little external rotation and do that in a position where the rib cage is slightly retracted, that's a healthy shoulder right there. And so you can kind of tell what's going on with someone's grip um, and translate that up to the shoulder too. So I don't know if that's something that you, or you have found. Um, yeah, I think we actually touched on this on the recording that we lost, but <clears throat> in times when I've when I've grabbed a straight bar and felt like I couldn't get away from being thumb or um, thumb forefinger heavy, it was really difficult to feel my lats. And so it would either turn into an upper back exercise or it would even just kind of hurt my biceps and I would have to find something else. Um, but, you know, as shoulder mobility improved for whatever reason, you know, working on it or maybe losing some weight, um, 
I would be able to access that that more externally rotated pinky heavy kind of grip. So even on a straight bar where it looks like you're you're gripping it evenly, I can feel the pull through my pinkies, and I could you know tuck my my elbows a little bit more. So we're still pulling in the in the frontal plane basically, but I'm getting my elbows a little bit closer to the sagittal plane maybe, if you could even say it that way. Well, and even then you're still getting some frontal plane motion. Like mm -hmm. there are very few movements that are purely one plane. Uniplanar, yeah. is that a word? Uniplanar. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was what I was trying to say is like- <laughs> You're it's, bomber? It's not, it's not purely one or the other. Um, but yeah, basically I could stay a little bit more externally rotated, get my lats a lot more. Now that being said, it certainly is easier to feel lats with, um, with like a neutral grip or a neutral-ish. I think for a while I was using that EFS football bar or American bar. The Elite FTS bars are yeah. phenomenal for this. Mm -hmm. They're, I mean, yeah, you can do so many things with that bar for people who have shoulder issues. It's, when people ask me for like pieces of equipment they want, mm -hmm. if they have shoulder issues for their home gym, that's one of the first things I recommend. What's nice about it, it doesn't, it doesn't force you into a completely uh, neutral grip either, like a 90 degree, it's more like a, I don't know, 45 to 60 uh -huh. degree or something. So it's, yeah, so it's, it's not this, it's not this, it's more like here. Mm -hmm. And that was actually really great for hitting my lats. That pinky thumb but thing. I, I guess never, that was, I never yeah. really, I never really heard that before. I know you guys touched on it in the last episode, but I didn't really think it through at the time. But I can totally picture, like, feel that in my mind now. The difference between the two grips. That's, that's really that's, interesting. And it's so funny because, like, if I talk to someone and I get on a call with someone who has like shoulder issues, elbow issues, you know, anything that's like upper quarter, even like neck issues. I can ask them like, what part of your hand are you most aware of? And most of us instinctually as humans, because that's like one of the key things that like differentiates us from other species of existing sentient life on this planet is a thumb. Um, we're very thumb forefinger heavy. And then for so, <laughs> for so many of us, like we live life sitting and typing on a keyboard, right? In this pronated position, um, which is inherently going to, again, like just drive us into this increased sensation or proprioceptive awareness of that area of our cortical part of our brain. Um, and, and it's just fascinating to me because it, people pay me a lot of money and I'm like, literally, can you feel your pinky? Nope. Maybe you need to do that. <laughs> Did you want to talk a little bit more of the shoulder health issue? You know, segue from... Oh, um, yeah. Well, so we, we were talking a little bit, usually before we start these podcasts, um, we talk about the things that we want to talk about and given this is a little bit of a refund from last week one of the things that we talked about was how i'll use that rack chain as a little bit of a diagnostic just for shoulder health and um i'll use it oftentimes as an indicator and especially for either my bigger guys that i work with or some of my smaller females and you think about two ends of the pendulum if we were talking about different you know different morphologies like those are it i've got you know bikini and wellness competitors who generally have a little bit too much laxity and more than that um, for women as ligament integrity kind of fluctuates throughout the month. And then for most dudes who are just live here, have a lot of upper body development. You think about something like a rack chin and you can see where people hold tension. You can see if they either put traction on like the joints and kind of like I was saying, the joint capsule, um, and I'll pull through that in a sec. Um, or if they really use what I'm going to call an active structure to maintain position where they are. And at any time I'm looking at shoulders in particular, because they're a very mobile joint, um, there's, there's a, an idea called Arthur kinematics and basically big picture. When we see something move, when we see an elbow flex, we see this, or when you see a shoulder move, we see this, but what has to happen is the ball has to kind of roll and spin and glide in the socket. And so anytime you hear someone talking about the capsule being tight, kind of what we're talking about is can that ball and socket roll and spin and glide the way that it needs to? Because if not, it means that something else is going to either a take more stress or b hold more, um, tension. Um, to accommodate for that. So from a practical standpoint, if we're thinking about the tension going somewhere, it's either going to go to an active structure like a muscle, meaning something else is going to get tight to stabilize you. And for guys like Dave and Justin and a lot of the other you know big dudes, I see a lot of like anterior delt, trap, um, even like elbow flexors, um, start to get a little bit overactive um, for a lot of women, which is what I'm going to call an active structure, right? Like those can generate tension. Um, for a lot of women, you tend to see less like active compensation, a little bit more kind of passive, meaning um, things like um, cartilage or the labrum or any other soft tissue structures that don't have the ability to actively contract to actively support the area. So that just went down a little bit of a nerdy rabbit hole. 
stop me if I need to like pull back. Um, but for like PT and diagnostics, I love the reaction because I can see if someone is more prone to relying on either these active or these passive structures for their stability. And chances are, if they do it in one area of their body, they probably have a similar propensity in other areas, whether it's low back or hip or something like that. Um, so between looking at their grip, which is going to kind of correlate with combined motions of either, you know, pronation, internal rotation, shrugging at the shoulder, um, or kind of combined motions of a little bit of external rotation through the pinky, and there's, there's a lot that you can just look at and inherently kind of see. Kind of like Justin, I'm sure you can kind of look at someone on their diet and kind of know what's going on with them. And you can't really explain it. You just know there's a look that goes with it. I think there's a lot to be said with movement quality for that too. There's a, uh, uh, a, a doctor, a, a cardiologist who was at uh, William Beaumont Hospital when I was there. Uh, I'm still friends with him, uh, Dr. John Stevens, and he was really into like uh, visual diagnostic stuff. Like uh, mm -hmm. with Michael Bell prolapse, you'll see a lot of red under people's eyes. And I always thought that stuff was really interesting. But you can totally see that stuff. Uh, like uh, you can tell when someone's going to get sick. Uh, if someone does their check-in and they're like randomly holding water, and they, they kind of look inflamed. A lot of times you can kind of say, you know, hey, do you have, you know, do you want to do anything different with sodium or anything this week? And they'll say no. And you'll say, I, I think you're getting sick, you know, and they'll check in the next week. They'll be like, you'll never believe it. I totally got sick like two days after that. <laughs> but, you know, like, I mean, when you look at it, you see people all day long every day, you know, and especially the same people in the same location and the same lighting with the same camera for week after week after week, you can really notice those things. And I always thought that's, that's always really interesting to me. Yeah, I never thought about that. You probably see, I mean, just the number of check-ins that you've had from people in the same spot, probably in like the same, you know, clothes, the same lighting, same everything. Yeah. You're like, you're seeing that, that per wow. I guess well, yeah, I, I just had a, a, a girl, jo yeah, girl, Jolie, uh, you could see today, uh, anytime she's ever had been like holding water, it's always been in her lower legs, you know, like through her cycle or anything like that, or, you know, off plan eating. Uh, and she always wears like kind of the same like a sports bra and whatever her like uh, pants are and like she had a lot of like water retention like in her armpit kind of you know and like it's just that you never have that why are you holding water there differently than you've ever held water sure enough she was mm -hmm. sick so yeah I mean that just that just a it's recent one that comes to mind but you can see what's that that's just a recent one that comes to mind oh, you see a lot of isn't that isn't that where lymph node is? That yeah, actually, that's, that's probably it. Yeah, 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 that's probably largely why. Yeah, the lymph, yeah, extra lymph node fluid. Lymph God, the lymphatic yeah. system is something that I, I am so curious about and want to learn so much about. There's so many, there's so much research and so much evidence coming out looking at the role of the lymphatic system and things like pain. Yeah, you and I think RPR we like to think stuff? very musculoskeletally. I've, I've seen it. Um, oh God, we could talk about RPR for a long time. Uh, so JL called me the first time he took a, a Douglas Hill class, which is at the time called Be Activated. And uh, he called me and was like, yo, you got to look at this. So, like looking at the diaphragm. I'm like, no shit, you think. Um, <laughs> this is after I took a bunch of the PRI courses that are all like diaphragm related. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. But the RPR stuff is more like neuroreflexive. And there's, there's, there are a million schools of thought that go down that road. If you really want to see a wild one, go to the uh, primal, it's the primal reflex release technique prrt and i worked with a mentor who i kid you not would like flick people's eyebrows or like you know flick something on their face and all of a sudden muscles start firing differently in the lower legs um really cool but um the lymphatic stuff is really really interesting to me because i think it really ties these systems together beyond just like at this point we know there's a huge influence on the nervous system and the musculoskeletal system like that makes sense because nerves drive muscles right but you think about the influence of the lymphatic system, and that's really, I think, where you get this whole like aquarium system working together. And I think it does a better job of kind of tying together how the body really works in a way that, I don't know, to me, it's just been really, really interesting. I need to take one of those courses, but. Yeah. All right. I mean, we really know like so little about the human body. You know, we, we think we know a lot because compared to what we used to know, we, we know a ton. But if you think back, I mean, was it like, uh, was it, I can't believe it's not butter, was, you know, like, th that used to be touted as like, the, you know, you can't, it's illegal to sell now because it's trans fat, <laughs> you know, there's like, like things, it's a, if you, you can think back, if you really sit and think about things that we thought we knew just, you know, 
in our lifetime, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, you, you see, like, we know a lot, obviously, but we, there's still so much to be learned. And I think, like, the, that whole, well, like, like with the lymphatic system, that whole how the body handles, I don't even know the word, stressors like that. I think over the, what the difference it's going to make in, in performance and, and, and athletics over the next 50 years, I think it will probably be equal to the difference it's made in the last 50 years. You know, it's, it, even then, if you think about it, you know, like, you think what yeah. guys ran in the, I mean, you know. It's, it's interesting to me, too. So just, just I'm like, always fascinated to meter... by, like. <laughs> Are we, and we delayed, I don't want to keep doing this. Go for it. Well, just if you look at, well, like an interesting thing, like uh, the, the uh, horse, uh, this is a total side topic now, sorry, but uh, horses, if you look at the, the Kentucky Derby, the times haven't changed in the last 150 years. Horses are like, they're born to run. They, the way they breathe is when they, when they stretch their legs, their lungs expand. When they, when they bring their legs together, their lungs contract. It's like a, not even an active thing, or, or it's not even a choice thing. It's like, so the only way for them to run faster is to increase their stride. We're humans, we could probably, you know, there's probably things where a certain baseline for us, but if you look at the 100 meter dash time from the turn of the 20th century to now, it's a world of difference. And all sports are like that. And all sports just continue to improve. And it's like, where is the upper limit? And it, it could be, who knows where it could be because we know so little about the body compared, you, I mean, we, maybe we don't, maybe we know a lot, but you'd have to assume that with how much we've learned in the last hundred years that we're probably going to learn a similar amount in the next hundred years and how, how dramatic it's going to be in, in, in changing how we, how we perform. I think even beyond that too, you know, I've been listening to these like really cheesy motivational things while training, but one of the things that brought up that was brought up was the fact that the four minute mile stood as like this barrier mm -hmm. for forever, right? Um, and as soon as someone broke it, it was broken, mm -hmm. I don't know, like a dozen more times, like shortly mm -hmm. after that. So it's really interesting thinking about, you know, for human performance, just how much our psychology affects um, the performance side of things and what we think we're capable of. And um, again, like, coming back to the role of lymphatics and neurobiology and all these, these things, no matter how much we think we know. And, and again, I think I really want to clarify for people, if you get on social media, or if you get in anywhere, people that come across with a very strong opinion, um, that are almost caustic in their opinion, they're probably going to swing to the totally opposite side of the pendulum in two years. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but with, with training too, um, and with PT, it's like, you see people in these camps and they get so married to their camp and it's like, it's like a death sentence to subscribe to anything or to ascribe yeah. to anything else. But then the pendulum always swings the opposite way. And so I think that for consumers, it's really, really important to remember that anytime you read or see anything, like whether it's related to nutrition, I'm sure, um, or performance or mechanics or PT or, you know, soft tissue work, whatever it is, chances are that's one camp that if it had a volume switch, that camp is dialed all the way up to, ours goes to 11. Um, <laughs> But for the most part, most of us are going to operate somewhere in that five to six range. And it's really, really important to remember that anything you consume, even if it's not presented as such, is probably an extremist point of view and or one small facet of really what actually has to go into optimal performance. Yeah. For it's, it's funny what you say about the pendulum swinging, not just among groups or among our whole industry, within our industry, but you'll see the pendulum swing so sharply for one person. Oh, like, God. I think yeah. I think you basically said this. Like, you'll when you see someone, when you see someone just absolutely emphatically say, "This is the way to do a thing," it's a fairly good bet that within a year or two, that exact same person, well, they they, I mean, if they've matured, maybe they'll present a more a more like measured approach. Like, maybe I was a little bit wrong, but unfortunately, it's more likely that they will go all the way to the other side. Yeah. It's like they'll, you know, for for example, someone might say like, "Low volume, high frequency DCS training is the way." Within a year or two, they're like, no, you know what? You've got to do tons of volume for bodybuilding. And maybe they'll vacillate between those two every year or two for like 10 years. But I don't know. I think social media has made this worse because I think I'm just thinking of people whose stuff that I would read, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago before, you know, Instagram and now TikTok are like so popular. Like um, Charles Pollock, I think would be a really mm -hmm. good example. Um, and if you haven't read his stuff, he, he died like it was four, four years ago now, but he had awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was definitely like set in his ways in a number of ways. And he had like the way, ways he liked to do things. But I also remember he adopted like 
kind of a John Meadows esque uh, training style for himself at some point, which was like totally opposite yeah. to how he would usually train himself. And he he wrote like a series on like what he learned from it and how he you know how it differed from the way he usually did things and like you know what he thought worked and didn't work, etc. Like that's a great example of the opposite, but that's unfortunately kind of rare. Well, I think it's important to remember too that like if you go and actually look at coaches who've been around a minute, like Justin, how long have you been coaching for? Almost twenty years. Since twenty-five before, years. Yeah. Well, I yeah, mean, twenty uh, years. The first check-ins, people. I had people uh, send me Polaroids. My very, very first client check-ins. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, because you, you couldn't send. So for, you've I been mean, at this twenty years. I've been coaching. You just the internet was so bad. Internet. I mean, for some of us, they haven't improved, but the internet was so slow. You couldn't. You couldn't <laughs> send video. Was gonna say it. You could not. You couldn't email video, and most email would have like a five megabyte limit, you know. And so, if you sent photos, they would be terrible. Well, I mean, there was no high. That was way before HD. You know, there was no 1080p anything, and so digital images were really pretty crappy. Yeah. So you've been at this about 20 years. I've been coaching 12 years. Yeah, 12 years now. 11 years. Um, and I think anyone that's been around a while is basically going to sit here and say anyone that has too much of a very extreme opinion. Like <laughs> most of us who've been at this will take the meat and leave the bone from almost any ideology, right? Like there's almost something with almost any ideology, there's something beneficial that you can take and apply and has some backing to it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think anytime there's a coach out there who's very, very extreme in their protocols or almost overly abrasive in how they come across communicating it, you, that should, I don't want to say raise a red flag, but almost raise a red flag. It should. Do you think we're, that's too, we're too complex. Think, I'm, I mean, there's no, to, you, you can try to go apply logic. And that yeah. was my issue with like with Mike Munster, you know, is he tried to apply logic and he was in Ayn Rand and all that. And, and logic's great. <laughs> but we aren't, you know, you apply logic to like linear systems, you know, like, like simple mathematical systems. We're not a linear system. We're very nonlinear. Mm -hmm. The amount of processes that go on in our body, we have, you know, like we got like a, like a quadrillion cells in our body. The different things going on between like our, neuro, you know, neurotransmitter stuff, the electrical signaling, the, you know, like the actual the mu muscle tissue, uh, what, what, how we're digesting, how we're, our mental state is. There's just so many things going on to try to, to try to dial it down into one, like, one simple logical conclusion is impossible because the what what the best logical conclusion in this moment isn't necessarily the best logical conclusion in the next moment because we're just there's too many processes going yeah. on. Mm -hmm. I I have a good analogy. I just thought of if it, if anyone else here is like a so I'm a software developer and if anyone else here is into that like if you ever program in a kind of an older low level language like C or C plus plus if you give the computer some kind of bad or circular logic, it, like you'll know it because you'll get a big failure. Like uh, you'll get like a seg fault or you'll access a piece of memory that's, that's, um, that's not there, so to speak. And that's a little bit like applying logic, which is basically sound to the body or to a system that is not linear. You'll get a conclusion that is like way out in left field where you've gone way beyond the usefulness of that logic and what you said about Metzer is a great example. It's like, okay, lower volume muscle, you know, muscle growth is kind of like a switch. Once you flip the switch, you don't need to keep pounding into the ground. It's like, okay, that, that means that bodybuilders with his era were probably doing more than they really needed to do. Maybe two sets, will get the job done instead of 20, maybe. And then he took that to this ridiculous conclusion where <laughs> Justin, now you've, you've put it this way a couple times, like, you know, do like one set of for chest in December and one set of squats for quads in, in, in June. And that's all yeah. the training you need to do. Any more that's than that. That's exaggeration, of course, but like not quite. He like, right. right. <laughs> um, yeah. I remember, I remember reading an article so yeah, where he was arguing it, that he was arguing an upper body day where you went in and did one all out set of weighted dips to absolute failure and go home. You know, it's like, you know, like you could, yeah. If you if you take that logic of you know, like just on off switch stimulate, you know, like you could you can go down that path. But I think it's any real logic would say that's probably not the path to go down. I mean, I don't know. Someone can try it. There, right. there used to be a guy who who used to uh, who who put sent his pictures in uh, like Muscle and Fitness. This is like in the eighties and early nineties. All he did was dips and pull ups. And, and he would send those pictures in every month, and they would publish them every once in a while. Of course, he didn't. He looked like someone who only did dips and pull-ups. He had like, so, you know, some <laughs> upper back 
you know, thickness and like some lower pecs and that was it, you know. And it, I always thought that was funny. I was like, man, I hope my yeah. menser looks at these and sees what, what this guy's lacking, which is side delt, <laughs> side delt bicep, you know. There was a there was an old thread on T Nation that this just reminded me of. There was there was a guy who just insisted that pull ups and deadlifts should be all that is necessary for complete back development, and he was just arguing vehemently that any type of row was just a redundant exercise, and you didn't need any rows. And of course, he was small, and of course, all the big dudes in the forum came in and know. said, "No, you need to row. We've all built big backs with rows," and he just wasn't wasn't having it. Yeah, that's and that's that is a that's a to a to a person when someone has those strong opinions, always they're small, always, and it's you know, and it's like no one can tell them any different, you know, and it's like, and I agree that there's a lot of bro science. I mean, no one will you know argue that in a sport, but but I would also argue that a lot of a, a lot of real science came out of bro science that you know and the but it's all it's always the the guys arguing with no size, that they're right, and everyone who's done the deed is wrong. Can we talk about, since we're on the topic of, like, small dudes trying to all of a sudden be, like, really, like, oh, yeah, this is the thing now? Uh, yeah. That study they came out that was, like, loaded stretching helps growth, and we're like, no shit, you yeah. think? Yeah. <laughs> Have After... you seen any of that that hullabaloo? <laughs> Oh yeah! After after twenty five years of of yeah, every every skinny nerd saying that that was all garbage. Yeah, that's like the uh, like yeah. the, uh, the uh, uh, Brad Schoenfeld just posted a well, just it was months ago, not even a year ago, a study showing like what stimulated muscle protein synthesis, the type of uh, type of training that stimulated muscle protein synthesis the most, and it was like an explosive type. The same thing that bodybuilders 20 years ago were all being told they were doing it wrong and they needed to lift slower. And yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it's fascinating to me because so many people are so stuck on this whole like, well, you know, evidence based, like, you know, journal articles, this, that, and the other. And talking about, I'm like, I'm a nerd. I think we know that. I love that kind of stuff. But at some point, you have to deviate from what literature is going to show because we're not the area under the bell curve. Um, mm -hmm. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably not. Uh, and you have to be able to go out and just do the practical application. And I think that's what really sets apart a great athlete, coach, whatever. If you're staying within what literature is showing, you're 20 years behind. Mm -hmm. Like if you're waiting for literature or research to show and demonstrate that something is effective, you're yeah. probably going to be at least 20 years behind. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, the problem. Uh, I think... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think all three of us, at least in a limited... And in, in like some limited capacity have like been in a lab or done mm -hmm. some kind of lab work or in some way contributed to something that got published. And if you have, you know what a painstakingly slow process that is. And you also might even have realized that even good research will not always get published or it could take 10 or 15 years for it to get published. Yeah, and it take you're, like, it, It's just so incredibly slow. By the time your research is written, published and has gone through peer review, your new research is is you know you that stuff you did a year or two years or three years ago you know it's like that's no longer your research by the time you get published it's like oh yeah i remember when we were working on that you're you know it's it's such a slow i i mean i graduated physics 2014 and i got a notification all right geez 2019 it might have been 2020 so like six years later that I, I, was, I was on a publication from, from some of my research. It's like six years, you know? I mean, and it's not like the physical world changes in six years, but, it, you know, that's a long time, you know? There's, to think that that, you know, and that, that's like the length of time you can get between... Yeah. So whatever, like, the forefront of things, you, you got half a decade before... Whether or not, it might not come to fruition. It might not be fruitful. Whatever people are, like, experimenting with currently you have half a decade before it'll fully go through like the whole peer review process and become established science or longer even, you know? Mm -hmm. I think people are so hung up on clinging to literature. It's almost like if you're not at this point, you're crucified as like as a coach or an athlete or whatever. Um, but if you're not able to come back again, we've talked about this in a number of episodes. If you're not able to come back to the physiological first principles of what drove the people doing the research to ask the question to begin with, you probably don't have any business even reading the study. Yeah. I, I might actually say, I don't know if you two agree with this, but I might find 
research a little bit more useful in dis like basically disproving that something yeah. works rather than yeah, I mean, for it's, sure. it's hard to really yeah, prove yeah. anything. But like, yeah. and, and like even, even then it's limited. But like, let's say the whole um, like metabolic stress thing is a tool to build muscle. Is is so? I, and the, the argument I think lately goes that metabolic stress in and of itself is not a good is not an effective way to actually cause like the accrual of new muscle proteins. Now maybe there is sarcoplasmic growth that can happen. I think that's pretty likely. But um, I think it's fairly reasonable now to look at that research and say, okay, look, all the pumpy work you're doing, maybe not that useful. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, it, you know, it, you have people saying for so long, well, there aren't any studies to show that this whole loaded stretching thing works. And it's like, well, we're seeing it work. We're pretty sure that, yeah. that this is causative. Yeah, and what's a study? If you got people in the gym doing it, and, and that's the other thing, like a study is difficult. You don't get bodybuilders. You know, you get people, you get university students uh -huh. who are broke and are just doing anything because they can get a couple bucks to be in this study and you get, they're non-compliant, they skip sessions, you get, you know, they don't, they don't want to be there. If you're doing anything like training to any level of exertion, they don't want to train to any level of exertion. Uh -huh. If you're doing anything with diet and nutrition, you have them for two hours a week. That is not, you know... <laughs> And, you, and you're, you're very often relying on self-reporting for a lot of additional things outside of the lab, which people, even, pe yeah. even people who want to self-report correctly are terrible at doing. It's just, you know, we're, we're the complex creatures and it's difficult to do these very, you know, like these complex studies on people that you have for a short period of time. And, and the best studies would be bodybuilders, and, which is why I think so much really good training and nutrition science comes out of bodybuilders because they're basically doing their lab rats you know they're not not you know necessarily intentionally or like well thought out but you know that's where the bro science comes from is you have these very large studies of tens of thousands of people trying things because they talk about it online and then you know and they actually care and put effort into it and, and follow it strictly much more strictly than a lab subject will be who's getting you know fifty dollars a week to come in and do two sets of leg extension with mm -hmm. a tourniquet to see whether tourniquet training works or whatever, you know? Well, and I think it's important to note too, that a lot of, as much as we talk about the studies are not done on, they're not done on bodybuilders. How do we know they work? Um, I think it's especially important because you're looking in a completely different system in terms of the physiological cell structure of what other adaptations have occurred mm -hmm. that are going to influence both the enzymatic as well as like the other neurological influences too. So like case in point, if you're going to take a cyclist, for example, or a marathon runner, um, they're going to have a different mitochondrial density. They're going to have mm -hmm. different uh, on and all the, I, if I hadn't just had whiskey, I could probably talk through all the physiology. Um, that's very different than taking a novice runner. And so any mechanism that is going to cause change is going to be amplified exponentially, probably by someone who has a prolonged training status. So even beyond just the black or white bodybuilder, not bodybuilder, you take someone who's like an advanced bodybuilder, someone like Dave, who's been training for a very long time. Um, and that's going to be probably even more different than someone who has a fairly long training history. But I don't know. I mean, it just, it seems to me like the, any difference there is between people who are going to fall under that bell curve and people who are on the tail end who actually care about the study is going to be amplified substantially um, the longer they've trained for probably. Yeah. Would you, and the real important yeah, stuff thoughts? always happens at the extremes, yeah. you know? I mean, that's really the, mm -hmm. the, the, the importance of any data is always, it's always in the differences. It's always in the extremes of the bell curve, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, the important stuff. I mean, the obvious yeah, stuff happens under the bell curve, but the, the interesting stuff happens in the rare cases. Yeah. yeah. And to, to me, everything that we just touched on is... <laughs> it's why I don't put a whole lot of stock in a lot of the commonly cited research relating to failure training and how we don't really need to train to failure. I mean, the, the, like, there, there's just no comparison between an advanced bodybuilder who has a great degree of, of like kinesthetic awareness who can really take a muscle to failure using a movement and an untrained student who is not only not good at all those things, but is not particularly motivated because I mean, mm -hmm. you, like just the motivation factor alone can be the difference between truly going to failure and leaving like five in the tank, which well, yeah, picture, if picture, you picture effective reps thing, which I do. then yeah. Yeah, picture is take some yeah. random random dude from a chem class and have him do a bench press to failure. 
that is an entirely different failure than you going to failure on the back. I mean, not even the same. They're, what they're failing for, who know, is could be, is, is certainly not going to be the reason you're failing. It's not going to, you know, they're failing because like their stabilizing muscles are, are are fatigued, or you know, they get out of a groove, or they just aren't used to pushing hard, or they don't really even know what failure is, or it got hard, and you know, like your failure is totally different. You know, like you, when you know when you're getting close to failure, you lock down your form a little more. Maybe you drive out of the off your chest a little more explosively. You know how to, you know how to like position your arms a little bit to get to get your elbows locked out under the weight a little on that last rep that you might have fought, failed on before you know it's not necessarily even a muscular thing you know like you, you there's just so much else going on that it's they're really two different things and to say what fa- you, you can't like the failure isn't even the same word for both people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. talking about failure too i think if you're on social media go pull up dave's post from hack squats yesterday it was the first post or the first time you've really been able to push the good table squats. straight during prep yeah, actually, Steve Kuklo was right there and was like, how many did you get? <laughs> um, he says, hey, by the way. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, but you thought those were what, one to two RAR, Dave? Yeah, I was, still held, I was still held back a little bit by the, just like having to push a little unevenly because of the injured side. So watching that side, like having been there in person, I would have said that's a very aggressive 0.5. But Dave knows himself to the point to where he knows that, like, if he really reset and he really needed to, like, if he had a gun to his head and someone's like, you get the rep or you die, he'd find a way to get the rep. But he would not be able to do one more after that. Yeah. That is failure training. Um, so today is Sunday the, the 18th. Check out his post from the 17th. Thank you. And I've, actually, that's... <laughs> understanding that concept is, like, how you can maybe grasp, like, why it is possible for some people to make really, really good progress on a very low, like, per session volume. I think Hunter Labar is a great example. Um, maybe one of the best you could see right now because, for like, he has amazing quads and his quad training, if you follow him for the last few years, he'll do, like, two work sets for quads. Like, most of his workouts are, like, one set to failure on, say, hack squat, if that's his main movement, one on leg extension, maybe one on, like, a unilateral movement. Um, like, he doesn't even do a back off set. But... If you really understand like that, you know, it's like what Danny said, like gun to the head intensity, like could you really get another one if you had to? If you were going to take it that far, you you can probably rack up enough. But enough did stimulus. you and he build your quads off of that? No. Yeah. And I think this is kind of what we talked a little bit about last week um, that didn't get, get saved as the, the case for volume and the case for frequency. Um, even for people who think they know how to train hard, like again, I'll use myself as an example. I'm... I don't want to sound like high volume by any means, but I've manipulated volume and um, frequency more often than not. Um, and I think that it's important to remember that Hunter did not build his quads on a two set, you know, two work set program. And neither did you. Like you built your quads by that, going, yeah. you know, to years of powerlifting of <laughs> sitting on the floor in your squat. <laughs> um, um, and also a lot of high volume training prior to that. So I think at some point it's it's a question of is it maintenance or is it slower growth? That's fair, yeah. I don't mean to misrepresent that and say that like everybody should always be training that way. I think I was I think some some people seem to think that like, well, well how can such how can a low volume in general work when the research shows me this or my own experience shows me this? It's like, well, the the point is that your idea of failure may not be somebody else's. And volume yeah, and volume of workload Volume, like, Go ahead. Uh, you know, like I, I can think back to like a, maybe like one of my DC training leg workouts where it'd be like like six oh five for eight on squat, then five forty five for twelve, and then four oh five for twenty. That's three sets. That's a lot of workload. You know, certainly you know like six oh five for eight, five forty five for twelve. You know, I mean the 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 strain that's putting on the body. Yes, it's three sets, but that's that's uh, I can guarantee I can tell you that's. W- far more taxing on my body than doing, you know, 12 sets when I was, you know, barely squatting 225 or something and didn't know how to push to failure mm-hmm. and did, you know, so, yeah, they're just like, the, the words we use a lot was... are, 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 it, are, aren't universal words. It's like that failure, you know, like what failure is for Dave on a movement that he's really good at is, isn't the same, it shouldn't even be used as the same word as someone who's doing their first squat. Because they, they're both going to reach a failure point where they can't do another rep. But what, what's going on in the body at that failure point is are two very, very, very different things. And I think that's kind of where the idea of defining failure, and we've probably talked about this before, at least on one other episode, is 
you know, is it pure concentric failure? Is it technical failure? Is it mental failure? I mean, there's so many other ways that you could split hairs there. Um, but I was even going to say just from the question of, you know, volume and intensity and things like that with the people that I work with, I have to get creative and find ways to drive intensity um, without necessarily using load or scaling volume so high that they're getting, you know, like 100 reps, uh, tissue exposure is just going to piss off tissue, right? So um, there are a lot of other ways to get creative with regards to moving the needle forward for hypertrophy. And um, I don't think that you have to be able to go to, like, if you watch Dave's set, that particular level of failure. I think some people respond really, really well to that. But for a lot of us, myself included, you do that for too long and you're just going to hit a wall and probably even dig yourself a little bit deeper and have to spend time coming out of that. It's. I think it's interesting what you said about mental failure in particular, too. Because um, I just personally, I feel like, well, we're like 12 weeks post-show for me now. Like, near the end of prep, like you got to, I got to a point where I guess I could reach what I might call mental failure just more easily because I'm so fatigued. And then I got better and better coming out of the show at kind of taking a set to true failure um, and getting the most I could out of a set. So it's like volume kind of increased coming out of the show. And then the last few weeks I reached a point where like I really had to pull it back again um, because I got, a, got back to the point where I really wanted to get as much as I hoped to get out of any given set. But I'll also notice that like I can, I can put on paper what I think I'm going to get done in a workout and think, ah, that volume's not that much. But if I'll take like the first, say, like eight sets of back to failure and then I'm running short on time, so I like rush into biceps, I'm like, there's, there's no way these sets are going to be productive at this point because I'm just, I don't know if you even call it mental failure or like what other neurotransmitters are at play here, but I'm just like tapped out for at least a few minutes, if not, if not an hour. And I think that is maybe an important concept to apply to, to anyone's training. And like well, one reason why you might not want to just by default take every set to even your definition of failure because... Like, as much as we like to think that we're, like, so motivated and disciplined enough to get through a hard session when we're planning on our training and we're excited about it, the reality is sometimes a bit different once you're three-quarters of the way through a very hard workout at the gym. Well, I think you can take, you know, if you're going to take a one session, for example, and split it up, you're going to have one or two movements that you're really pushing, like, for true concentric failure. Like, you're kind of, you know, those sets that you almost can't sleep thinking about the night before. Like, for us, it's deadlifts. Like, mm -hmm. let me take four or five for as many reps as I can kind of thing. And uh, everything else really can be redefined as like, yes, you're still trying to approach failure, but it's a much different um, type of failure. And that's more kind of the muscle <laughs> um, rather than the, the, you know, just the movement and things like that. And I think that you really have to limit yourself to particular movements within session. You can't, if you're going to take every set to true concentric, you know, all out failure to where you finish a set and you feel like taking that set drained you mentally. You, you can't do every session that way, yeah. I don't think. Well, I remember uh, after being in grad school and not really training for a number of years and getting back into it, like, seriously, I, I don't... It's something, if I had never did, done that, I wouldn't remember, but, like, there was a lot of parts of my body... A lot of parts of lifting, a lot of things going on that were really back to square one. And I remember... Mm -hmm. uh, it was... It's hard to even explain, but it was really confusing. Like, on deadlifts... Uh, I remember, like, I would get start, you know, like we, like I would pa like start passing out, and I couldn't understand why. And it was like, like probably some kind of adaptation where, for years from training heavy and doing Valsalva, my body was just used to fighting through that and maintaining consciousness, and I lost that for. Yeah. I mean, and eventually it did come back. And I remember thinking, like, God, that's that's really weird. I wonder if that happened in other sports, like in football. You know, like you get used to smashing your head against someone else and you don't get knocked out. Like I remember thinking, like, man, if I got sucker punched, would I go go out now? Because that would happen a lot and I would have to stop a lot of like deadlifts squats a lot of really heavy movements short of what I thought was real failure because I was like I don't know if my breathing yeah. was different and I, I remember that too having to relearn how to breathe through a through a, a movement yeah. uh and uh and, and yeah really I know go ahead Sorry. well it just really struck like because that was like a it was a new a new way of failing for me because I hadn't failed like that since probably when I was very first started lifting when it was, you know, and my strength wasn't nearly that high. It was just, it was a weird thing to learn. And, you know, eventually my body adapted again and it was like it had used to be. But I remember the first few months, it was really weird. Like I didn't get to pick where my failure point was because there were other things going on that I was no longer adapted to. I hope that people listening can like really appreciate that. Like the fact that you've been lifting as long as you had and, you know, 
if someone's been out of the gym even for a couple months. So, like, I, I took a year off when I had, like, CNS stuff going on. For someone like you, who's been at this for since you were, like, 10, basically, yeah? Yeah, yeah. That yeah, was yeah, when I got you got my your first, first weight set? Yeah, 1987, yeah. <laughs> so um, I was a little, a little younger than that, but yeah. For, for someone like you who's been in, at this for so long to basically have to relearn how to train to some degree, I hope people listening can kind of appreciate to give yourself a little bit of grace and give yourself that time. Because I think it's very easy to compare where you've been to where you are currently, and that gap is a pain point. Um, mm-hmm. But there, all you can do is close that gap one moment at a time day to day. Little yeah. bits. And the most fun, and that's, <laughs> you get those novice gains again. That was the most fun I ever had training. I was gaining. Like, oh, right? I was getting like a pound a week. Yeah. It was like, man, this is fun again. It's like Paul Barnett it's funny, I almost pulled recently, up, too. I almost pulled up pictures from when I first started working with you to stage weight this year on stage. We're pretty, pretty close, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a pretty long lifting history before I started with you, but it's just crazy how much when you've had to take time off, you almost do get that second round of like newbie gains. Yeah. Uh, it's great. That's Yeah, that's what I'm currently going for right now. I'm just trying to... Yeah, is that is that it? Yeah, yeah, getting way out of shape, so then I can have the newbie gains again. <laughs> How many times in your life do you get to tap that button, the newbie gains repeat? I don't button? know. I think I'm tapped out. Although I, tra- <laughs> I, tra- I was proud of myself. I trained with Joe Seaman and uh, John Revis and hung with them on uh, on chest and legs. They they they, I held. I, I mean, I think Joe went heavier on hacks than I did, but every every other movement for both both days, I hung with them rep for rep. You pay some. Um, yeah. Nice. Well, I mean, I was, I was play, I was pulling out the old, the vet, veteran tricks. You know, I really sandbagged on the warm ups, but I saved everything. <laughs> for the main Did you wrap your knees? <laughs> no, but inside my pants, they didn't know about it. I had a whole squat. <laughs> I, Exposed I now. <laughs> Speak. I feel like back in the, the DC area time, like when you were reporting projects super heavy, like it became the thing to do to wrap, to wrap your knees around your like. Not sweatpants, but like your nylon pants. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Give yourself a little extra. Yeah. Oh yeah. Anything you can get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we Can't used see. to. There's a couple of videos where I, we put a, ve- a Velcro belt on under our shirt, and we were like, "No one's gonna know we're wearing a belt." <laughs> no like way. <laughs> um, we did have a question in the Discord um, regarding. I will just let you read. This, this question is concerning um, oh, AAS increasing androgen receptor expression. So it's common nowadays to hear that um, taking gear actually increases your androgen receptor density. Mm-hmm. And the recent review on this research says that was published. Save this. No, uh, sorry, reading the, reading this for the first time. But the three strongest papers supporting that conclusion all have pretty big caveats to them. And the best quality paper that we have shows that there's an initial increase, but that this increase then falls back down despite uh, two to three times elevated testosterone levels to baseline. So could you touch on this? So I guess just to sum that up, um, research has shown, or we thought for a long time, that um, taking gear actually upregulates the number of androgen receptors that you have, which would kind of um, debunk that whole idea about needing to come off or cruise for the purpose of um, you know, resetting your receptors or resensitizing yourself. Not to say that it's not a good idea to come off a cruise, but the but for doing it for that reason, I think we've long thought has, has been yeah. kind of BS. Um, but maybe that's not the case. I don't know. Justin, have you seen this? Yeah, I don't. I mean, I'm I not. It's not my area of interest. It really isn't. I don't. I never bought into the receptor downregulation for antigen receptors at all. I just never did it. You got there's too many pros that have been on for 20 years that uh, still making progress, still grow. I just. I, I mean, I would, the, the, the uh, androgen receptor density increase w- w- initially after the use of uh, androgens, I would buy that for sure. That seems like the anecdotal experience of what I've seen, absolutely. I don't, I mean, I think you need to cruise for other reasons. You need to cruise to, to not to maintain your receptor density or receptor upregulation, to, re- to, to maintain your health so you can continue push, you know, lo- long term. But I don't think, I don't, I think, I would think it'd be hard to make the argument long term that aside from the fact that you lose muscle while off, that you would make better progress 
being on half the year, off half the year, relate due to yeah. anything to do with receptor upregulation or downregulation. Yeah. Well, like 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 from, probably... from an evolutionary standpoint, it just seems like a pretty silly thing that like what what what's required for for reproduction, sex hormones that there was like that 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 they could be upregulated or downregulated. It seems like that would be not a very good evolutionary trait if the, the hormones required to carry on a species were that sensitive to to up or down regulation. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense with how hormones work either. I mean, obviously hormones are like involved in some kind of feedback loop oftentimes, but like what would the feedback loop here be? Like, mm -hmm. oh, the body senses that it's gained too much muscle mass, yeah. so now we need to you know, downregulate ARs, but I, I feel like the whole needing to, again, I'm not saying you shouldn't come off a cruise, but again, like doing it for this reason seems silly, and I think that there's a lot of um, correlation, causation, confusion that probably goes on here, because plenty of people will observe that, they'll, they'll observe what seems to be um, a cycle not working very well after say 12, 16, 20 weeks, and that doesn't mean that after that period that you know, the gear isn't working anymore. I mean, the, the hormones are still doing what they do. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's say, you know, you've got a good plan in place to where you came off, um, you came off of a diet, maybe it was a show diet, maybe just any diet where you got very lean, and then you leveraged the rebound in combination with gear to gain a lot of size. Well, you know, only the first two, three, maybe four months of that are going to be super effective, and then that effect is going to level off. Now, and that's, you know, that's the effect of your diet plus the lean state that you started in. But that effect leveling off doesn't mean that the gear's not working anymore. Yeah. It means that you just don't have that advantage at play. Or it could be that, if they, I mean, this is unlikely to happen over the course of just one cycle, but eventually you will get big enough to where the dose that you're currently using isn't giving you the same effect. And so at that point, you know, you would need to up the dose, maybe. Maybe there are other things that you could do, but it might be the case that the current dose you're at just isn't going to support as much growth at your current size as it did when you were you know, 10, 15 pounds of muscle lighter, just for a couple of examples. You know, and well, females actually, I mean, you could, you kind of almost get a, a case study there because they're, you know, their estrogen levels fluctuate throughout the month, you know? And so you can, if, if like, if it seems like if there was any change in the way those hormones express themselves on the receptor, then I don't know how I'm going to word this. My COVID brain's not, not clicking, but, uh, Women kind of already have that up and down, and there's not. It's not like it, it, it affects their ability to get pregnant. You know, like it's just. It's not like the 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 estrogens have different effects on year seven of you know when they're they're fluctuating month by month. I, I don't. It just seems. I, and I don't want to speak on it because I'm not an expert. I don't. I'm not up to date on the studies. You know, and what anything I've read is is old. But it just seems just from like a well, like you know, first principles logically. We need these hormones to reproduce <laughs> species that requires that they that they work and don't ever stop working for us to survive as a species and and we have survived as a species and all animals have survived as a species so it's likely that that they don't lose right. their effectiveness over time yeah i think clinical applications might be kind of instructive here too obviously if we're talking performance it's what we're talking far above clinical doses yeah. but still i don't think it's the case that um, testosterone replacement patients need to increase their dose exactly. over time because Good of point. the androgen yep. receptor. I don't think their doctors often tell them, hey, you've got to come off of this Good. medication and dramatically point. improve your quality of life. Um, we're say, I mean, I think people will make similar arguments about growth hormone. I'm pretty sure that growth hormone patients, whether they be hormone replacement people or most people with muscle wasting diseases, they don't just arbitrarily come off. So. Yeah, good point. Very good point. Right. Well, actually, well, you've, you've got a diabetic daughter. Does, your, does the doctor ever tell your daughter, hey, just Come stop off. taking your insulin for a few <laughs> yeah, weeks? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then take some some other, like, uh, like ketotophen or something to, to re... To re uh, <laughs> that's yeah. another one I don't like. Yeah, hopefully but, that works as well, because life kind of depends on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like the, the this... Species depends on the fact that the hor our hormones don't uh, don't ever lose potency, and like you said, that's obviously not super physiological levels like we're 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 doing with anabolics. But if if estrogen and testosterone didn't stop working after a while, we'd 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 be in trouble. Yeah, I I, I feel I can't remember where it came from, but I feel like I've heard someone make an argument with regards to myostatin in, in the same in the same context. Like it's not 
It's not that the androgens stop working per se, but it's that your myostatin becomes so elevated over the say the course of the of a cycle. That would you've yeah got that to take, that take measures I could to dial that back down. I could get behind that argument. That makes more sense. You know. Yeah, and if anyone hasn't heard of it, my, myostatin is the is it a, what you call it a hormone? It's yeah, it's a, it's a hormone that yeah. it kind of throttles muscular growth. So like. There are human babies who are born with myostatin deficiencies who become obscenely muscular in infancy and then they die early, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, or you can look it's at like... like a cardiomyopathy kind of yeah, thing? I th yeah, I think so. Or like Google myostatin cow and you'll see these yeah. cows who Belgium are genetically blue. modified to have... Yeah, exactly, to have low or no myostatin and they're just like... It's like if you took a comic book um, bodybuilder drawing mm -hmm. but applied that to a cow, that's what this cow would really look like. Yeah, that makes more sense because that's an actual, like, that's the body's natural checks and balance for, you know, for the overexpression of, like, growth hormones. So that would, that, I could, mm. I could see that, but I don't think as far as, like, adjunct receptor density or upregulation, downregulation, just doesn't, doesn't seem to make sense. But I don't want to say more than that because I, it, it's not my area of interest, really. Yeah. Content like this, visit www.teamtroponin.com. This video is brought to you by First Attachment Nutrition, battle-tested nutrition, expert-formulated supplements. Join the First Attachment Revolution.